Hi, it's Steve. Thanks for joining me again on this second video about the fool's cap method. Um, if you, uh, for some reason, missed the first video, there's a link on the page you can click on that'll deliver that to you. We were talking last time on the subject of writing a novel, particularly getting over the hump from being unpublishable to being publishable. And I was talking about this technique called the fool's cap method that my dear friend and mentor, Norm Stahl taught me years ago. And the basic concept is to put the entire outline of the novel on one page, not in a 55 page outline, not in a 300 page Bible, but in one page. And that in that way, you kind of break the back of the story and right at the start and you get a handle on it right away. And, but then that leads to the question, well, what exactly is on this page? What do you put on the page? And I said that I would take you through what, um, what I used, the fool's cap page that I used for writing The Legend of Bagger Vance, which was my first published novel. So that's what I'm going to do now. So we're talking about a story, but this could be any enterprise at all. This could be uh, getting your daughter into Harvard. This could be opening a restaurant. This could be invading, invading Afghanistan. It'll all work in, the, in this concept. Step number one, whatever the enterprise is, whatever the story is, break it into three parts. This is probably, I learned this from Sean as much as from anybody, Sean Coyne. Um, this, if there's a single golden rule, if there's one magic bullet, this is it. Why three parts? Because three is the magic number. It has been since the pyramids. Act one, act two, act three, beginning, middle, end. Now here is what I did on this page for The Legend of Bagger Vance. There's Act 1, Juna's Crisis, Act 2, The Golf Match, Act 3, Bagger Returns. It's as simple as that. It doesn't need to be anything longer than that. Now let me talk about some stories that you uh, will probably be a lot more familiar with to explain the 1-2-3 situation. Um, Rocky, the first Rocky. How can you break that down on one page into three acts? incredibly simple. Rocky starts out as a bum. Rocky and gets picked by Apollo Creed to fight him. That's act one. Uh, act two is Rocky trains, all the stuff of climbing the steps, running up the steps, Mickey, the trainer, um, chasing the chicken around, punching the, the sides of beef. That's act two. Act three, the fight. Rocky fights Apollo. Act one, act two, act three. The Hangover, the movie The Hangover. Act one, the guys go to Las Vegas. They lose their friend, Doug. And also things happen that they had forgotten overnight. That's act one. Act two, they search for Doug. Act three, they find Doug. When you have your story, when you can break down a story, this is what why the Fool's Cap Method is so great. When you can break down your story into something so simple, it really gives you confidence that you know you've got a handle on this thing. So step one is breaking the story down into three parts, act one, act two, act three, putting it on the paper. Step two is the device of narration. How is the story told? Now, one way to think about this, let's think about um, To Kill a Mockingbird. Now let's say that we have act one, act two, act three, very clear in our minds. The next question becomes, how do we tell the story? Whose point of view is it told from and what is the narrative device? Now, um, if you think about that story from the point of view of Harper Lee, the writer, trying to figure out how she's going to tell it, she could have told it from the point of view of Atticus Finch. It could have been told from a grown-up, how he did the trial, how he defended Tom, et cetera, et cetera. It could have been told from the point of view of Boo Radley. It could have been told from the omniscient author in the third person. Each one of those would have altered the story, made it an entirely different story. Now what Harper Lee decided, and oh, in fact, she could have even told it from the point of view, one of the, one of the minor characters in there, the boy living next door, Dill, was actually the real life Truman Capote, who was Harper Lee's friend. So she could have told it through his point of view. Instead, she decided to tell it through her own point of view as the young girl scout, the daughter of Atticus Finch. And she also further decided to tell it in recollection rather than in real time. And what that accomplished for her 
and made the story so great was that through a little girl's eyes, she could communicate the mystery of Boo Radley, this crazy guy next door, you know, was he a killer or whatever? And also she could be suitably in awe of her dad, Atticus Finch, the wonderful, great lawyer about whom this, the whole story was about. So that's the narrative device in that. Um, in the legend of Bagger Vance, I have a young boy named Hardy Greaves. I really kind of stole this from Harper Lee. And here, I, his name is Hardy, this is the H. Hardy narrates the match, which is act two, the golf match, the central thing. He narrates the match in recollection, and then he narrates the return of Bagger Vance, act three, in real time. So this was a device of having a young boy who participated in an event years and years ago, recalling it in a kind of hazy, uh, romantic memory, and then having events unfold in real time as he's, t as he's telling it. So that, here we now have Act 1, Act 2, Act 3, and the narrative device. Before I finish this up, let me talk about The Hangover for a second, because this is the first movie, The Hangover, which has a great narrative device. The device there is the boys go to Las Vegas, and they, they, get, uh, they get drunk, and they're about to park, go out on the town and party. Then the movie cuts to the next morning. They're waking up, can't remember a thing. There's a live tiger in the room. There's a live baby. There's a chicken. And there's all kinds of other stuff going on. And they've lost their friend, Doug. So the movie unfolds in them trying to uncover in real time what happened the night before. And that's what makes what made the story work and what made it great. So that's the narrative device. Now, can you see from what I've just said, if we have act one, act two, act three, only in just one little part of the page and up here, the narrative device, we've already got, we've pretty much got the story licked on one page. And we haven't even talked about the, what I'm going to tell you here, the next part. Okay. Part three, the next thing that we need to do that we address on this fool's cap page is theme. And again, this is a killer. This is the most important aspect of all and the hardest aspect of all. What is the story about? And I have written, I've said this before, I've written novels all the way through that worked and I had no idea what the story was about until it was all over and I finally kind of had to, had to think about it. But the theme must be there because the theme will tell you the climax, the antagonist, and all of the events from back to front. Now, just as an example, what is the theme of Casablanca, let's say? Casablanca is the story of a guy who starts out thinking only about himself and who by the end of the story is willing to sacrifice himself for the greater good. That's all, that's all it takes to write out the theme. Rocky, the story of a guy who's a bum who proves to himself and to the world that he's not a bum. Now here in The Legend of Bagger Vance for the, for the novel, not so much the movie, um, the theme was the authentic swing, which on the page here, I also have authentic swing equals previous lives. And the second thing I have, swing is remembered. This was a, these are two concepts. The idea of, that there's such a thing as the authentic swing, that's why it's the title of this book that's about the writing of, of The Legend of Bagger Vance, that we each possess one swing, which equates to one self, one soul, that is ours alone, that nobody else has. Therefore, the crisis Juna's crisis here, our protagonist's crisis, is that he has lost his swing, lost himself, lost his soul, and so he must recover it. That's the whole process of the movie, Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. And the idea, this is actually a steal from Plato. Plato believed that knowledge, all knowledge is not learned but remembered. And so th what I stole was the golf swing is not learned, it's remembered. So in other words, our character who has lost himself, lost his soul, has to somehow refine who he is. And that's what the story's about. Now, if we have Act 1, Act 2, Act 3, the narrative device and the theme, we are 90 yards down the field and the goal line is in sight. Now, fourth part, uh, and now I'm going to go a little bit more into actual detail here of what's on the page, is the inciting incident and the climax. 
Now, let me give you an example of inciting incident if this term is not familiar to you. The inciting incident is the moment when the story begins, and the crisis and the climax is when the story is resolved. A lot of times a movie will start and it won't really take off until 15 minutes into the movie. Um, the inciting incident in Rocky, we start off with Rocky, he's a bum, he's you know hanging around Philadelphia, and Apollo Creed, the heavyweight champ of the world, picks his name out of a book of contenders, the Italian stallion, and says, I'm gonna fight him. So now when Apollo, the world champion, picks this bum, that's the inciting incident, that's when the story takes off. Now, the inciting incident in any story always also implies, embedded in it, is the climax. From the minute Apollo Creed picks Rocky, we know the climax is gonna be Rocky fights Apollo Creed. So if you can take your story, whatever it's sort of floating around in your head, and, and find out what is the inciting incident, and then what is the, what is the climax, you have a spine all the way through that story. Um, and if you think that this is formula or uh, you know too predictable, I'll take you back to uh, the Iliad, to Homer, and you know in the 950 BC. So what we have so far is break the story into three parts, determine the narrative device, how the story is being told, figure identify the theme, what the story is about. And then the inciting incident and the climax and the through line between them. Now that is enormous. In a way, I think the writing of a story, you kind of go into this garage and on the floor of the garage, you have all of the parts in separate places that will make a Maserati, but you don't know how to put the Maserati together. This is how you put the Maserati together. I strongly urge you, if you don't use this, do something like this. If you want to do a 55-page treatment, do it after this. If you want to do the 3 by 5 cards on the wall, do it after this. But do this first. Break the back of the story in your mind. Now, that's this video. Um, this is part two. We are also going to include here an excerpt. There's an excerpt, a uh, link to uh, another part from uh, The Authentic Swing. We'll have the transcript of, uh, of this. And then in a few days, I'm going to come back one more time with uh, a bunch of goodies that we'll all put together that'll wrap this whole thing up. Again, uh, thank you very much for sticking with me. Um, you know, uh, this is a, a brand new uh, adventure here, uh, but uh, I hope it's helpful and uh, I'll see you in a few days.